In 1977, Atari changed home gaming forever with the Atari 2600 console. It was an amazing success and it's gone down in retro gaming history. In 1982, Atari released the 5200, which was the size of a small moon. It had unreliable controllers, wasn't compatible with the vast library of 2600 games and it wasn't much in the way of a success and failed to sell anywhere near as much as its predecessor did. In 1986, Atari releases its third console, the 7800 Pro System. Now, of course, this was only a few years after the great gaming crash of 1983, so retailers were still very wary of the video gaming market. So this console was never going to have it easy. But I kind of like this console, but I don't like this wobbly, horrible RF output. So today, I'm going to pull it apart. I'm going to teach it a lesson. Join me here in the Retro Shed today as I modify this Atari 7800 for composite video output. Now a quick bit of background on the Atari 7800 if you've never seen one before. It was released in May of 1986 in the US and PAL regions got theirs the following year in 1987. Now this console had a troubled launch and it was originally due to be released in 1984 but it didn't actually get released until 1986 due to the shenanigans and what was going on at Atari at the time with parts of it being sold off. Now the Nintendo Entertainment System, the NES, was selling extremely well at this point and this machine was really meant to give the NES a run for its money. But it never really did. It's not that it's a bad console, it's got some great arcade ports and the visuals are a great leap from the 2600 and the 5200, but the sound is pretty poor and there's a good reason for this. This console is compatible with the Atari 2600. Those old cartridges slot straight in with no other hardware required, but part of this backwards compatibility means the 7800 also shares the same sound chip as the 2600. And that means, of course, 1977 sound effects on a console that was released almost 10 years later. The 7800 also plays its native, more advanced games, of course. The most of these are really quite good arcade ports of favourite games from the golden age of the arcade. There's some great games for this console, and I do like it. The 7800 console came with its own two-button controllers. These ones were very similar to other joypads that were actually all the rage at the time. You can also use a whole range of Atari-compatible joysticks, but some of the games actually do require two buttons, so you will need to ensure you have a two-button controller for some of the games. Now here it is set up on a rather nice Sony Trinitron TV, and you can see that the old RF output is decidedly crap. It's not good at all. So I decided it's time to order a composite mod kit and get rid of the old RF modulator in this console and make the display look a little bit nicer. Right, stage one, let's undo these screws and uh, let's get the case open and see what's inside. So the main board just lifts out of the casing. So the whole board's got this RF shield on, which looks like it's secured down with these little twist clips here. So I'm gonna just need to straighten those with some uh, long nose pliers and hopefully I can get this foil shielding off. Bane of my life those RF shields are. After a bit of gentle pushing and pulling and well, perhaps not so gentle in places, um, managed to get it off in one piece without damaging anything. Nice. The uh, the kit was ordered from the future was 8bit.com. It's a deluxe composite video mod and it was a very reasonable £17.49. So uh, let's see if it's any good. So looking at the instructions, what have we got to do? The modulator looks like it needs to come out completely. So I'm going to have to desolder that. Um, and the flying leads attached to various points on the main board. Um, and it does look like there are some components to be removed as well, like R62 that you can see there and some other odds and ends. Okay, finally I've got all the uh, the shielding off. It's actually on both sides of the board. You've got the, the top half and the bottom half, which fits like a clamshell, and I've managed to get all that off. Um, I've just come to desolder the modulator, and if I can get it to focus in there, you can see that it looks like somebody's already had uh, a bit of a hack around with this. That's not neat at all. It's a bit of a mess.
So finally, after quite a bit of desoldering, actually, I've managed to get the modulator off and I've cleaned the board up so it's nice and pristine. There's a lifted track there, which I'm going to have to do a bit of repair on. Shouldn't be a major problem. I'm not happy about it, but you know, these things happen. Uh, okay, right, so I removed a bunch of stuff from the board um, and they were a couple of resistors, one transistor, that coil, not sure what that is. Not sure what that is. Um, and the board is now looking... The board is now looking pretty bare in certain areas, so that's the components removed. I'll just show you quickly what they are. There's the instructions there, so everything arrowed there has finally been removed. So on with the next step. The next step is to solder this little module to the main board and you've got a socket there. I don't know if you can see that, it won't focus very well. You've got a little socket on the end that the AV cable goes into and this bunch of flying leads that no doubt solders to the board. So I'm going to go ahead and attach that next. Right, so I've cut the wires all down to the correct length because they uh, they do come supplied quite long. Uh, I've not gone too short just in case. They've all been uh, pre-tinned so it's ready to attach them to the main board now. So what this mod essentially does is taps the video and the audio and presents it on this uh, three and a half mil jack plug here. And with the kit you get this cable and it's got a jack plug on one end and it's got the video and the audio on the other. And I'm wondering why it's got left and right audio because this console as far as I'm concerned doesn't give a stereo output. This chip is only a mono chip, I'm pretty sure of that, but um, uh, we'll find out anyway. Let's see what it does. Right, it's time for a test. Let's see if this all works. Okay, so I'm not going to bother putting uh, those heat shields back on just yet because just in case, so I don't want to have to pull it all apart again. So what I've done, I've, I've connected the um, cable up to a SCART adapter. So let's wang that in the back of the TV and connect the other end of the uh, video and audio cable into there. Hang on a minute, I'm just going to drop the camera. Not literally. There you go. So that fits in there. That's where the RF socket used to be, which is now gone. Uh, and let's see what we've got. So and uh, we've got a picture which looks difficult to see because of the glare actually, which looks a lot nicer than... Okay, turn that down. Right, initial test is good. I'm gonna go ahead and put the heat shield back on now and put it all back together again and we'll give it a proper test. particularly like this. This is this is Demon Attack on the 2600 and I particularly like this game. I do like Phoenix and this reminds me of Phoenix quite a bit actually. Okay so it seems to be coping with the 2600 cartridges quite happily. Let's take a look at some of the native 7800 games. Okay, Miss Pac-Man on the 7800, and this looks a lot more like it, doesn't it? This is a bit more faithful to the uh, arcade version. Although this damn controller doesn't make it easy to play at all. Well, I've got to say, this controller is dreadful. <laughs> it makes playing this very difficult indeed. I mean, the game itself looks quite good, but my god, this controller's horrible. Firm favourite of mine here, Gallagher. Can't beat a good shoot em up, can you? And this is play this plays quite nicely actually. As it's only left and right <laughs> and fire, the control pad doesn't do a bad job on this. What I seem to have noticed, I think, playing these 7800 games was I mean this console was released after uh, the NES. Um, and it just doesn't look as powerful, it doesn't look as nice as the NES. I don't think it's up to scratch at all. The NES has a, a better look to it, I think, visually and sound-wise. 
So back in 1986, if it was a choice of this or the NES, I think I'd have gone for the NES, to be honest. Here's a particular favourite of mine, it's Dig Dug, and this looks really good compared to the 2600 version, quite an improvement. Again, a little let down by the sound, I think. controller. <laughs> that went wrong. Right, thank you for joining me. I'm happy with that. It's always nice to uh, ditch a modulator and an RF cable for something a bit nicer, and that's giving, uh, I think, a much nicer picture than it was. Now, just in case you're interested, this mod kit, uh, the same mod kit works in the 7800, works in the 2600 Junior PAL and NTSC. Um, it also works, I believe, in the Master System. Yes, it does, Sega Master System 2. Uh, so it's uh, it's quite a good bit of kit to buy, and considering it's only £17.49 delivered, it here in the UK. That's not bad. Uh, you can get these from The Future Was 8-Bit. If you just Google them, uh, you'll find the kit. So thank you very much for joining me. Hope you enjoyed that. And uh, we'll catch you again really soon in the Retro Shed. Take care now. Bye-bye. were neither very large nor very small, but the others stood still or moved slowly compared with the speed of light. Will you do this for me? I want it to pop out, I want it on canvas or something like that.